Our speaker for this final session tonight is our brother Tony Cloud. I first uh, met Tony a number of years ago when he spoke uh, on uh, this lectureship. I don't, don't remember exactly how he and uh, Maxie uh, met, but I know Maxie has done a number of meetings in Saldotna, Alaska, where Tony uh, serves as the preacher, and uh, Maxie uh, invited him to come down and be a part of the lectureship some years back, and he did so, and I was able to meet him then. Uh, he has been back um, a number of times since then, and I'm glad personally that he is back today. He was born in Tacoma Park, Maryland, joined the United States Army at the age of 17, is a graduate of the Southern California School of Evangelism, and later earned his Doctor of Ministry at the Theological University of America. Tony has preached the gospel since 1990 and has worked in eight different states. And as I mentioned a moment ago, he currently serves as the preacher for uh, the Church of the Lord in Saldotna, Alaska, out on the Kenai Peninsula. And he and uh, his wife, Nikki, have two children. Mark mentioned them as well in prayer, D'Angelo and Tierra. And all of them are with us uh, tonight. And we're so glad they were able to come with him uh, down from Alaska. To um, have any kind of association with Tony Cloud for very long at all is... Uh, to develop uh, a kinship uh, and a compassion for him. He is a loving individual. Uh, he believes uh, very strongly in uh, gospel preaching, in being evangelistic, in uh, exhorting and challenging those of us who are able to listen to him from time to time. And I know we'll be encouraged tonight. I know we'll be challenged tonight. <laughs> And that's what uh, we need, and that's what we look forward to tonight as Tony addresses us on the topic of Philip the Evangelist. Let's give our attention to Tony Cloud. Thank you, Eddie, for those kind words. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> if uh, you wonder why it's so cold, we're from Alaska, so we brought some of the weather down with us, and... We're glad to be here. We've always been so uh, happy and so blessed and privileged to be able to be at this particular lectureship and have this opportunity to speak to you and break forth the bread of life. We're thankful for the eldership and the leadership here who has extended this invitation and has done so well with uh, such a wonderful lectureship. You all don't really hear the comments that I've heard about the lectureship uh, prior to coming and even while attending. Uh, this is one of the best lectureships in the brotherhood, and so we thank you for, uh, for that. It's, it's, it seems as though every time you come to a lectureship like this, uh, you, you feel like a student in the midst of many teachers, and what a blessed gift uh, that is. My assigned topic is Philip the Evangelist, and we're going to begin in Acts chapter 6, if you'll open your Bibles. Uh, allow me for just a few moments to... Uh, introduce uh, some background information. This is the, the first lectureship uh, outside of the state of Alaska that my entire family, my sons and my wife, were able to attend with me, and so I'm thankful that they're here and uh, supporting me, so thank you to them. Beginning, if you will, at, at verse 1, we'll start with the problem. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So a, a complaint arose um, against the Jews and the native Hebrews. The Hellenistic Jews, if you will, were those who were born of a Jewish parentage outside of Palestine, who spoke the Greek language, and use the Septuagint in the synagogues. While the native Hebrews uh, were Jews uh, who were born in Palestine who spoke, who spoke the Hebrew language. And a complaint arose against these two groups. In verse 3, there's a solution. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over 
this business. Here's, if you will, a summary from the New Testament uh, Acts, if you will, by, by Gareth Rees. The qualifications, men of, number one, good reputation. In other words, they had a servant attitude with no prejudice, and they were men full of integrity. The second being full of the Spirit. Now, they had the baptismal measure of the Spirit, but not the miraculous measure of the Spirit. They were, if you will, full of the fruits of the Spirit and Christian lifestyle. Uh, ones who had a holy lifestyle or holy living. And then there were men of wisdom, men of prudence, men of skill, able to make wise and impartial decisions in the daily distribution of food. And one of those men chosen was Philip, the evangelist. If you will, in verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The most important business and service in Christianity is in regards to the word. And as we serve God and strive to live for God as leaders, in particular in the Lord's church, as members in the Lord's church, we must, if you will, take the time to study God's word. We must, if you will, take the time as ministers to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and spend time in prayer on behalf of ourselves as well as for the saints. There was a result from this particular um, uh, circumstantial uh, opportunity here in verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Notice that the word of God continued to spread. The apostles laid their hands on them, giving them both a charge as well as a, uh, the ability to perform a miraculous acts. We'll come back to that uh, later in this particular lesson. You know what people are trying to do? People have tried to stop God's word. They've tried to no avail. The more that Satan fights against the Lord and his church, the more that it grows. It's almost as if it seems that when we find ourselves in difficult times, we draw closer to the Lord. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the Lord's church. Now, if you will, uh, in verse 8 and verse 9, we'll find that Stephen preaches under this great persecution. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicily, uh, Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. Now, wouldn't you think for just a moment that if there's this persecution, if you will, that's arising against the church, and there's this opposition that's arising against the speakers of God's kingdom, that we'd stop speaking? Wouldn't you think that, that Stephen would just not say a word? You see, that's unfortunately the way that some of the members of the church are. Sometimes when persecution arises, we stop speaking. When we feel uncomfortable, we stop speaking. When we're in the midst of uh, the world, if you will, we stop speaking. It's almost as if we live two lives. You know, we live one life uh, maybe in the building where we're, we're living for God and we're doing the right. But then when we get to our jobs and we get to our respective places, we, we live a totally different life and we stop speaking about Jesus. But not here, you see. Here in this text, these men go out and they begin to preach about Jesus. There's some opposition, the synagogue of the freedmen. But there's a masterful presentation from Abraham to Jesus that Stephen gives. And then, as a result, a great persecution arises against the Lord's church. Saul. 
Saul is presented to us as the antagonist. He comes and he brings uh, many great persecutions against God's church. He ravages the church violently, the Bible says. He goes from place to place. He grabs Christians from their homes, drags them out of their homes, and tells them, stop talking about Jesus. If you were living in those days, would you stop talking about Jesus? Would you say, you know, the authority says, stop talking about Jesus. That's the wrong authority. In chapter 8, verse 1, now Saul was consenting to his death, speaking of Stephen, and at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Is it not an amazing fact that God has a way of taking all the bad and turning it into good for his people. Remember when Joseph was carried off? And what did he say to his brothers after his father had passed? You, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And doesn't God tell us in Romans 8 and verse 28 that God makes all things work out for the good for those who love the Lord? No force can stand against God. The gospel of Jesus was proclaimed. I just want you to get that message, if you will, in, in your mind tonight. That, that regardless to what America does, the gospel is going to be proclaimed. Amen. Regardless to what Islam does, the gospel is going to be proclaimed. Regardless to what the atheists say, the gospel is going to be proclaimed. But the question is, are we going to be the ones to proclaim it? Or are we going to be the ones to remain silent? Well, see, Philip was one of those preachers who preached the word of God in spite of the persecution. Look at verse 4. So, again, Paul is wreaking havoc on the church. And, and, and now we get into this, this lesson, if you will. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, and they kept their mouths closed because they were afraid of being taken to prison. Is that what your Bible says? Isn't it amazing when you have faith in God? It doesn't matter what's going on around you. You can still preach Jesus. You can rely and trust in God. The world will let you down, but God will never let us down. He never has. He never will. They go about preaching Jesus. And then in verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Here's something sad. Here's something really sad. America. You know, it's hard to get brethren to come to a lectureship or some extracurricular, if you want to call it that, some extracurricular activity outside of maybe Sunday morning worship as we divide the worship services and say Sunday evening is not as important and, you know, Wednesday night really doesn't count. And, and so as long as I get there every now and then on Sunday morning, that's good enough. It's hard to get brethren to commit to the Lord. But if I called my brethren tomorrow and said, hey, there's a great game on, and I, I've got two tickets, and I want you to come. They're front row tickets, right behind the, and right in the perfect, and it, they'd be there with bells and whistles on. We call our brethren and say, there's a great movie out, and, and my wife and I are going to go and see it, and we have two extra tickets. Would you like? And they'd be there with bells and whistles on. And yet, because I have a hangnail, I can't make it to worship service. Isn't that amazing? Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Here's the question. What is it going to take to wake us up? I pray God it doesn't take this great persecution. What is it going to take 
Preachers, we have to preach the word whether, whether people want to hear it or not. Amen. See, it's, it's impossible to do this juggling act. It's just, you know, they do it in the circus, but you can't do it in the Lord's church. This juggling act of trying to please men and trying to please God at the same time is just something that, that cannot happen in verse 10. Paul says, uh, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I can't do both, you see. It's a juggling act, especially men. Men, we're not good at doing two things at once anyway. But to juggle religion, if you will, to say I'm going to serve God in one hand, and can't do that. For, for, for the Bible said, Jesus himself says, no one can serve two masters. Either hate the one and love the other, or despise the one and hold to the other, but no one can serve both God and man. And it's an absolute impossibility. God asks for all of our heart, all of our mind, in all of our soul, not, not a portion of it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. We must preach the truth. And you know, the truth hurts. And, and that's probably why Paul, you know, in 2 Timothy 4, in verse 2, told Timothy, he said, you, you preach the word, be instant, in season, and out of season. And you know when something's out of season, we still have to preach it the same way. And maybe it doesn't read this way in verse 3. You know, it says, for the time will come. Maybe, maybe, maybe today it reads more like, for the time has already come. When many will not endure sound doctrine. But will heed for themselves teachers having itching ears. That's sad. What has to happen to, to make us desire God? When it comes to the word of God, the word of God, the book that we have divine from God, this is the only way we can be saved. There's no other way. And you know this big problem we have on marriage, divorce, and remarriage? If you get into the book, we wouldn't have that problem. Love your wives as you love your love your wives like, like you love Christ. Wives, love your husbands like you love Christ. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. When we look at brothers and sisters in Christ, we're looking at Christ. How would you treat Christ? How would you treat your spouse? The word of God is the only book that can fix us because we're broken. The word of God is the only book that teaches us how to get along with our neighbors who may hate us. It teaches us how to love ourselves. It teaches us and gives us self-esteem. It teaches us how to be one with God. We have to get into the book. Satan knows something. Satan knows that if we don't get the right message, it's impossible for us to be saved. He knows it. So he's going to try to keep it from us. And we can't allow him to do that. People don't like truth because truth does something. Truth exposes error. You know, when you get up in the morning, you look into the mirror and you say, okay, all right, perfect. And then you leave the house. And then you get out and someone says, you got something in you, that you, we, don't, we don't like to hear. Oh, thanks for telling. Oh, I, I'm flawed, you see. Truth exposes error. And so when someone reads the Bible, they're reading the truth of God's word, and it talks about us. It talks about us. And we don't always like to hear what it has to say about us. But when you look into the mirror of religion, spirituality, you see yourself and you see a flawed person, someone who is full of sin, who needs a savior, someone who's in trouble without God. Verse 12 of Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active or powerful, depending on your version, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intentions, or intents, of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, 
but all things are naked and open to the eyes of whom we must give an account. God knows something. Turn to Matthew 13. God knows the heart. Now what I want to do is I want to kind of hang that thought. I'm going to hang it out here, and I'm going to come back and pick up the heart in just a moment. God knows our heart. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. And God's going to deal with our hearts. Samaria, their hearts were ready. They were ready to receive the word of God. You know what we have a problem doing, brothers? We have a problem with shaking off the dust. Sometimes we hang on to, oh, I gotta, I've got to convert. You know, we don't convert anyone. God does. So we go out and we preach the message of Jesus Christ. And as we preach the message of Jesus Christ, they either receive it or reject it. If they reject it, we do like God told the apostles to do. You shake the dust off and go to the next house. We're looking for willing hearts. Someone, someone has said once that we, you know, we, we, you can make a horse, uh, um, I guess you, you bring a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. I don't know that that's our mission. I don't know that our mission is to lead the horse to the water. I think our mission is to make the horse thirsty. He'll drink. I think that's our mission. And that's what the Word of God, that's what the Word of God does. In Matthew 13, in verse 19, as, as Jesus tells or speaks this, this parable uh, here, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. Have you ever turned to 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Have you ever heard someone say this in a Bible class? You're sitting down with them and you're studying with them and they say to you, I don't I don't see how God could. Or they might say, uh, um, I, 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 don't, I, don't under, I don't see that. I don't see. That's not my God doesn't do that. I can't see God. You know what? They're not lying. They can't see it. Because Satan has blinded them. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, uh, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. They're blinded. That's why they can't see it. Don't get frustrated when you go out and study with someone and, and they say they can't see it. They can't. They refuse. See, what happens is they're looking into the mirror of self. And you start studying with them, and they start hearing things like, like be baptized to be saved, and they start thinking about all their ancestors in the past, if you will, that haven't been baptized. And they block it out of their minds. They don't want to hear it, and they don't want to talk about it. And they'll tell you, I can't see it. And then we walk away sometimes discouraged because we feel like I've done everything I could, possibly. I, I, we've looked at the Word of God. We've tried to handle the Word accurately and in truth. And I don't understand why they couldn't see it. They didn't want to. Turn to Acts chapter 8 again. Uh, back to our text in verse 12. Despite the persecution, these went out to preach Jesus anyway. But what... Did Philip preach? That's a good question. What did, he, what did he preach? Acts 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. He preached the kingdom and he preached the great name of Jesus Christ. And our brethren say, don't talk about the one church. If you don't talk about the one church, you're not preaching the gospel. Right. See, they go hand in hand. They, they preach the kingdom, and he preached the name of Jesus Christ. Turn to Jeremiah 17, and we'll come back to this in just a moment. Jeremiah chapter 17. If you decide in your heart based on the scriptures to preach the truth 
in nothing but the truth, people will listen. I didn't say all people. Willing hearts, they'll listen. You know what happens? It, there's so much fluff in the pulpits today. There's so, there's so much of this, of, this, of this, I feel good, you feel good, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, everybody's okay, God's okay, it's going to be okay, even hell's okay. Now people are confused, right? They're confused. And so some people say, I even want to go to hell. You want to go to hell? Of course. My friends will be there. Well, that may be true. But there's not going to be a party down there. There's so much fluff in the pulpits today that it's messing people up. We've got to preach about the evils that abound. We, we've got to preach the matters of the, remember I hung that out there? The heart. L listen to what Jeremiah says, chapter 17, uh, verse 9. The heart is deceitful. Uh, wait a minute. The world's heart is you know, it doesn't distinguish it, does it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Your version may say, as a New American Standard, desperately sick. Who can understand it? Or who can know it? The heart. Wait a minute, God. Wait. My heart. Yes, Tony. That's why you were a child of wrath, Ephesians 2, because you walked according to the evils that abounded. Wait a minute. Church members' hearts. Yes. All of us. All of us. And when it comes to preaching the gospel, we have to get dirty. We have to get down into the trenches, if you will, and we have to deal with doctrine. We have to deal with division, denominationalism. We have to deal with all of those things. But we also have to deal with the sinful heart. Because that's what's keeping people from coming to worship services. That's what's keeping them from obeying Jesus Christ. It is not necessarily the doctrine or denominationalism. It's the evil heart. It's the mind of wickedness that's keeping people from doing God's will. And when we preach fluff and we don't make anyone think about their relationship with God, then they don't have to think about it. And when they don't have to think about it, they find themselves living in wickedness. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, brethren, we have to cross that line. Oh, I'm not going to have a lot of friends, but I have to cross that line. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Why do you think it is true that most Christians don't live right, don't think right, and don't talk right. Why do you think that is? Because the mind is wicked. And unless you put Christ in and get that garbage out, we're going to be in trouble. And that's why when there's fluff preached from the pulpit, we don't always like to hear things about us but God's word never goes out without accomplishing what he desires. Don't ever forget that when someone comes up, Brother Parrish comes up and preaches the gospel and he reads a verse and you get upset, it pricked your heart. It wasn't him, it was God. You see, it's God's word that's going out and accomplishing the will of God and God is dealing with your heart and God is saying, Brother Cloud, you got to change something. And I can either do one of two things. I could accept it or I could go against it. But it's my choice. You say, well, well preacher, well, what do you think is sick when you think about the church? Well, what's sick about the Lord's church? Well, think about this. Let me show you how sick our minds really are. Look at verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this is a Christian. They are entangled again in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Wait a minute. You learn about the greatness of God and the fact that you were lost, 
the fact that I was, I was out in sin and then God rescued me, freed me, saved me, and then I go back out and live in the world again? I get entangled in sin again? You don't think that's wicked or sick? Something wrong with that. To leave Jesus, we can read the Bible version and say, look at that guy, what a rich young ruler. He just turned his back and walked away from Jesus. How could he do that? How many Christians are doing that today? And then if you will, look at uh, verse 21. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. They turn from God. They have turned from Jesus. And when gospel preachers go out and start preaching things against, against or contrary to God's word, it's sick. And it's sick when Christians do it. And we sit back and think, well, preacher, don't, don't you know, ruffle our feathers, if you will. Don't say something that's going to offend us. Let God do the talking. And then in verse 22, God describes how sick it is. He says, uh, but it happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own. Have you ever seen that before? You ever seen your dog get rid of something he's eaten and then go back and lick it up? Well, that's how sick it is for a Christian to leave Jesus. And then a pig goes back to wallowing in the mire. You say, well, preacher, what does this have to do with anything? Well, turn to Acts 24. How does this relate to Philip? Philip, brethren, crossed that line. But first, let's look at Paul. Acts 24, he's talking to Felix. And he, he, he begins to, to, to speak to him, and, and uh, Philip is, is asking questions, or Felix rather is asking questions. Idolatry and paganism. Very, very uh, powerful in, in that world, in that time. And thank God it's not powerful. You know, today there's no idolatry. We know that, right? Yeah, I think there's a whole lot of idolatry today. Lots of idol gods all over the place. And we have to deal with that. The majority of the world follows a false Jesus. What are we going to do about that? When we think about uh, the issues that abound that's keeping people from being saved, what are we going to do about that? Acts 24 and verse 24. Listen. And after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, listen, Felix was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because Paul was dealing with that man's heart. He was afraid. And now Philip, Philip has to go back, if you will, and preach to Samaria. And guess what he does? He deals with the matters of the heart. There's a sorcerer in that town. And these people, go back to Acts chapter 8. These people are mixed up, you see. They're confused. Uh, they're, they're listening to, to this great message, if you will, of, of, of Philip that came from God, and they're confused. And if you will, uh, in, verse, in verse 8, there was great joy in the city. But look at verse 10. They were confused. To whom they all gave heed, speaking of Simon the sorcerer, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. What? They were, you see, they're all mixed up. They're all mixed up, you see. And so Philip has to cross the line. Do you not think that Philip dealt with this paganist, if you will, this paganistic uh, relationship to the world? He dealt with the sorcery, the wickedness of that man. And then he dealt with the evils of the heart of the people and says you've got to turn from this witchcraft. You've got to turn from this sorcery and turn to Jesus. He crossed the line, brethren. I know some of you have turned me off right about now and said, well, I'm done with that message. This is preaching Jesus. See? Because when you preach Jesus, you preach about the one church. I mean, what would Noah have been like if Noah said, well, God said just build one ark, and you know, we built the ark, and this is great, but you guys go ahead and build your own boats, and God will save us all. You know, not only, number one, did he lie to the people, but number two, they're going to die lost. How much sense does that make to know the truth and then hold it? to hide it. Why would we do that? Let it go. Don't put it under a peck measure. Let it go. Philip deals with the issues of the heart of this place. Look at verse 9 and following. There was a certain man 
called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people in Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. You notice he didn't preach a different gospel. The same gospel that he preached to them is the same gospel that Paul preached. The same gospel that Peter preached and all the apostles. The church and Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, the death of the burial and the resurrection. And in preaching that gospel, in verse 13, the Bible says, Therefore then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs that were done. Even Simon was baptized. Don't think you have to invent some new type of teaching or some new idea. Just preach the word of God. That's all we have to do. God carried him away from this great Gospel meeting, if you will, came off to a desert road to meet one man, you know, the eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading the word of God. He was confused reading Isaiah. And he said, uh, you know, God said, join, join this chariot. And, and Philip joins the chariot and said, understand us now what thou readest? You know what you're reading? Someone says, Tony, tell me how to, how to start a Bible class. Do you understand what you're reading? That's a good way to start a Bible class. You understand what you're reading? How can I? Let someone guide me. And the Bible says, opening up with the same scripture, he started right there where he, when you're teaching a Bible class, start where the people are. Just start right there. Want a good place to go? Start right there. Sometimes we're so afraid to get or engage in a Bible class that we, you know, we shy away from it because we're afraid of what kind of questions they're going to ask us. You start preaching Jesus and the kingdom of God, those questions, you don't have to worry about those. Just preach the gospel. That's all we have to do. Now, there were a miraculous, I need to get into this miraculous part real quick, and then I want to get back to our close. I'm running out of time here. That's good about having that clock. You always know where you are. There was something interesting. Simon the sorcerer, he, he watched Philip closely. You know, how do I learn? How do I learn this secret art? Where did this thing come from? How, how do I do what he did? How can I heal a person? How can, I, how can I do these miraculous things? And he watched them carefully. But then in verse 14, when the apostles uh, who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had been, only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they didn't have the ability to perform miracles or, excuse me, to pass the miracles on to someone else. They were baptized, received the Holy Spirit. Philip had been preaching, and Philip could perform miracles, but they could not. And so Peter and John are, are sent down, if you will, and then look down, if you will, at verse 17. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given to them, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted that power of God. And you know what happened? The apostles dealt with that man's heart, made your money perish with you. We ought to tell members that. The Bible says if you have an ought against your brother, don't give until you go and get it right. Your money's no good here. Not until you get it right. In closing, we're going back to this, this eunuch. And the eunuch down in verse 36, after hearing the word of God, they went down the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? He didn't say what hinders me from saying the Lord's prayer, the sinner's prayer. He didn't say what hinders me from believing and being saved. He said what hinders me from being baptized. That's the result you get when you preach the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. That's the result that you get. And this evening, we would like to extend the opportunity for you tonight. 
You've heard the word of God. We trust that you believe it and you're willing to change your life to live for Jesus. To make a good confession that you believe Jesus is the son of God. Be baptized, immersed in water that you might be saved and walk with Jesus until the day you leave this earth. And if you are a child of God and you've been struggling in your faith and you're looking at and thinking about the fact that how could I not be faithful and committed and dedicated to my great and awesome God? And you like the prayers of the church. The elders and ministers and brethren are here today to do that for you. While together we stand and sing our song of invitation, why don't you come?